Hi, welcome to the October 1st edition of the Time Form U.S. PaceCast. My name is Craig Mulkowski and I'm going it alone today as my usual co-host David Aragona isn't able to make it. Uh, I'm going to be talking about all the great races run in the United States this week and the Breeders' Cup implications that they have. I'll certainly be talking about the figures for the races, some of the race flow. And I reached out and took a few questions from some people on Twitter saying I was going to be by myself today to get a little bit of interaction going. Uh, I'm going to look at the races at Belmont, San Anita. We had a couple at Churchill and also some at my home track of Remington Park, where I was actually in, attend in attendance, had a great time and uh, actually got to see some really good racing there. So we're going to start with Belmont and talk about the Grade 1 Jockey Club Gold Cup. Uh, it's probably the most controversial race of the weekend as it was won by Code of Honor on a disqualification uh, Code of Honor and the, the first place finisher, Vino Rosso, who was DQ'd for bumping in the stretch, both got time form U.S. speed figures of 128. Uh, the pace was pretty even in here. It's not coded red or blue. Uh, I wouldn't call it moderate or quick. It was just kind of average for the final time. Uh, I don't think it had any really negative or positive effects on anyone. I think this was a case where the best two horses were able to run one too. Uh, Tacitus had to be the disappointment in here. Uh, he went all five to two, uh, third choice, uh, preservationist, the favorite didn't do much running at all, was beaten pretty easily after pressing the pace, but neither did Tacitus. It just came down to the top two. Uh, I thought it was a really good ride by a rad Ortiz to take Vino Rosso and, and show more speed than he usually does. He just kind of took it to the field at the ass outset, but code of honor was able to rally as he usually does. He was as far back as three and a half lengths early and just kind of wore down the others and, and took on Vino Rosso. It looked like it was going to go right by, but that one dug in. And as I said, we wound up with some, some bumping, uh, subsequent disqualification. Uh, I did get a few questions about that on Twitter. I really don't want to dwell on the DQ too much. Uh, my opinion is I would say in a vacuum, it's probably the right call. Uh, I would like to see that be a DQ every time we see that kind of incident in the stretch. But uh, I understand where people are coming from. That That is not a race, uh, an incident that you need, would normally see result in a disqualification, in my opinion, in New York. Uh, we I watch most races every single day from there. I've seen what I feel are as bad or worse left up. So that's the frustrating part for betters is I think we just don't know where we stand when these things happen. And when I saw the replay the first time, I, I assumed there wouldn't be a DQ and I was surprised there was, but that said, um, I thought we got a really good effort from the top two. Like I said, those 128s are definitely grade one figures. It's a really nice win for code of honor. Uh, he's probably virtually sealed the three-year-old Eclipse uh, Award over maximum security with this win. He had the big win in the Travers. Now he's beaten older horses, even if by DQ. It was still a really good effort by him. So I'm not sure what the future holds. I'm pretty sure Vino Rosso is going to be headed towards the Breeders' Cup. Uh, there seemed to be some trepidation on code of honor whether they're going to send them there or not so i'll just have to follow along i'm sure the drf reporters will be all over it and let us know what's going on with these horses and and where we're going to see them next so i don't want to speculate too much on them uh the one horse i will mention is tacitus uh like i said he was disappointing I'd be curious to see how he runs again without the blinkers. I, I haven't been too impressed with him the last couple times with blinkers. I understand Bill Mott trying him. He was having some issues, and he may just be an immature three-year-old colt that needs to develop some more. But personally, I'd give him a shot without the blinkers again. Obviously, the next start would probably be the Breeders' Cup Classic if he's in that race. So it would certainly be a tough spot. But with the field we're looking at this year, it seems like a wide-open race maybe they'll take another shot with him. It could very well be that he's just not as good as I thought and some others thought, but I'd probably give him another shot without the blinker. So worth following to see what he does. Uh, the fastest race of the week went to the grade one Vosberg, and that was with Imperial Hint getting a nice 130 time form U.S. speed figure. Uh, he was coming off a, a nice 136 in his romping track setting win last time, track record setting win at Saratoga, and a bit different tactics this time as he, 
He was, um, you know, went right to the lead. He opened a quick lead, but Forense Fire was right on his tail. He's a horse who generally comes from a bit more off the pace. Uh, he had run second last time out, also at Saratoga, in a decent effort behind uh, Matoli, who may or may not be the division leader. The sprint division is far and away the, the strongest division, in my opinion. We got some really good horses running really fast figures, and Imperial Hint might be right at the top of it. He was super game in this effort. He actually got passed in the stretch by Forense Fire and fought back while in tight along the rail. And he is just one game little horse who who digs in and usually gives his best. He started out the year not in his best form, but he's certainly there now. Uh, I'm sure he's probably being pointed to the Breeders' Cup sprint. And like I said, that is one deep, strong division. Uh, very tough. Good effort by Forense Fire, who got a 127, way back to the other two horses in this field who were really overmatched. Uh, this was a virtual match race from start to finish. Neither of the other two were ever contenders, so it's close to a match race at top-level racing as we're going to get these days. Uh, that's going to lead us to, to one of the questions I took from Twitter from a GG Gensler. Uh, he wrote asking with the short fields being the new normal or figures hard to make. Uh, his question's a little longer than that, but it, it's pretty much that's the gist of it. And I would say, yes, anytime you have short fields, you have less data points to, to build your numbers on. It makes it a little bit tougher. And the more short fields you have, the tougher they can be. But but I don't think it's a deal breaker just because we had four horse fields uh these particular figures at Belmont on that day, we're going to talk about Midnight Bisu, who was also in a, a short field race here in a minute. Um, they weren't particularly tough to make. Uh, there are times when it can be, it can make it tougher. I would certainly prefer bigger fields in every race. It would, it would make the figure making process easier for me. But So to answer the question, yes, they can be tougher, but I don't think it's one that it, it makes a question. Uh, you have to question the figures as a, if they are accurate or not just because of the four horse field. You have to look at the whole card in total and see what you think. And in this particular day, it wasn't a very tough day. Uh, that moves us to the grade two bell dame where we had midnight Bisu. Uh, went off at the ver as the very heavy favorite, one to nine in here. Uh, deservedly so. She's undefeated on the year. She's she's just been laying waste to her competition before running into a late last time, who she beat in a thriller uh, by a nose. But she was she had this field over a barrel. She was able to win pretty easily. She was challenged at the top of the stretch by Wildcat, who's just coming back from a layoff. This was her third start off a layoff and, and she's getting better every time i think she's going to be primed for her best run if she shows up in the breeders cup this staff uh but the 119 speed figure for midnight b sue it was what she needed she can probably run faster she has run faster there wasn't much else in here besides wildcat and she had a bit of a tactical advantage over that one showed a little more speed and a solid effort i don't want to get too overly excited about it um I will mention, somebody asked me a question about her. I, I didn't write it down in my notes here about her trying the classic. I think a, a mile and a quarter would really be stretching it for her. So I, I wouldn't try it personally if she was mine. I, I don't think the connections have any intention of trying something like that. Uh, there were a lot of people had questions even with her going a mile and an eighth. Uh, she's probably laid those to rest. But a mile and a quarter again facing older males i'm not sure that's for her at this point uh not sure it ever would be uh i would stick to the disc staff she'll be the favorite for sure especially i've heard some talk about elite perhaps trying the classic so as far as older fillies and mares go she's not really going to have to deal with any top quality ones it'll mostly be three-year-olds trying to step up and beat her so expect to see her in the disc staff she'll be the favorite uh, the figure she runs, I, I don't think she's a cinch. Some people tend to think they'll probably want a single her. She she certainly is even a horse a year of the year contender at this point, but not a filly I'm overly excited about. I'm a fan, don't get me wrong. She wins. I, I've seen her in person more than a few times. I, I root for her, but when it comes to the betting window, it, we'll just have to see who shows up, but I'd probably be willing to take a shot against her in the disc staff. We have some three-year-old fillies running some nice numbers out there, and I wouldn't be surprised if they could give her all she wants. 
Uh, that's going to lead us our last two races to cover at Belmont Park were for two-year-olds on the turf. Uh, these, I believe, were winning your in races for the Breeders' Cup Turf Juvenile and the Juvenile Turf Phillies. Uh, the first one, the grade two Miss Grio, was uh, won by Selfishly, who came in as a maiden for Chad Brown. Uh, she had run second in her debut. She wasn't bet overly uh, heavily in that debut, nine to two, and she wasn't bet heavily on this day either. She was five to one. I believe she was the third or fourth choice in this field, behind a few others, uh, Chris Stahl notably, who had one last time out at Saratoga in a, a smaller stakes, I believe it was. Who uh, she was the two to one favorite, but selflessly was able to get the win. She won by about three quarters of a length over Crystal. It wasn't a particularly strong race, in my opinion. Uh, the winner got a 94, which is um, it's okay for two year olds, but we've seen many races faster already this year. In fact, uh, her stable mate, Princessa Caroline, ran on Saturday, first time out in a maiden race, and she won with a 109 time form US speed figure. So, quite a jump to that one. That, that filly's a half to lead Lady Eli out of uh, uh, American Pharaoh or by American Pharaoh. So, there's certainly more promising Philly, Phillies out there. We're going to get some shippers come in from Europe almost assuredly. So not really a horse I'd be anxious to bet in the Breeders' Cup. Certainly promising, but I don't think this is Chad Brown's best. He, he picked up a nice win, put her in a good spot, but not overly enamored with this race. Uh, the same could go for me for the grade three Pilgrim with uh, Structor. He was a bit faster. Uh, he ran a 100 time form US speed figure for his win on Saturday. Uh, he was he beat Andesite, who got a 99 in second by a head. But again, not overly blown away with these. Once again, good good positioning by Chad Brown right off the uh, maiden win to jump into the stakes race, which is pretty much how it works with these two-year-olds this time of year. All the promising ones, for the most part, go from maiden wins in the stakes races. But, you know, Structor, again, he ran 100. It's okay. The runner-up with a 99. Uh, maybe there was a little trouble for our country, who was coming out of a very troubled trip the time before. He had broke his maiden with a 101 time form U.S. speed figure, then had that rough trip at Saratoga where he ran up on heels was ranked, dropped way back to an 84. It was a rough pace that day for a closer. Uh, he, he ran back to his 98 with maybe a little trouble, but again, these are not horses I'm all that interested on come Breeders' Cup Day. Of course, we have to see the field and who else is going to show up, but uh, I'd probably be leaning toward Juros at this point, unless maybe some of the maidens that have not maidens anymore, but some of the maiden winners with big figures are able to get in the field. Maybe they could be worth a look, but these races were just what they were, grade two, grade three for the males, and, and I'm not sure we saw a whole bunch of Breeders' Cup uh, contenders here. Uh, tough to say at this point, we'll, but we'll see the field, and we'll certainly talk about it more in the future as we get closer to Breeders' Cup Day. Uh, that said, let's move on to Santa Anita, where the biggest race and maybe the biggest surprise of the weekend came in the grade one awesome again stakes. I know my co-host David and I didn't even talk about this race on our Friday forecast where we actually handicapped the races in advance just because McKenzie looked almost unbeatable and uh, towered over the field. And he wound up going off one to five, but... Unfortunately for his backers, uh, he didn't back it up. He he was beaten by Mongolian Groom, an unexpected pace setter to say the least. He was coming out of a pretty decent fifth in the Pacific Classic. He wasn't beaten too bad with a 121 time form US speed figure, but certainly not a grade one type number compared to McKenzie who had run 130 and 129 in his last two. But he dropped down to a 123 here. Uh, it's a bit puzzling of an effort. Uh, I'm not sure what the strategy was or if he was fully cranked up. But we had the fractions as slow. Uh, the, the quarter mile, the half mile, and, and even the mile fraction were all coated in blue. The race did pick up a bit between the half mile and the three quarters when Mongolian uh, Groom opened up his lead a little bit. But McKenzie kind of, he broke on top, dropped back moved wide, dropped a little further back, made a nice run on the turn when the, when the pace got a little hotter, but he just didn't have any finish, and Mongolian Groom was actually pulling away a bit at the end. Uh, he, he wasn't making up any ground. McKenzie doesn't like the whip. Uh, he got hit once trying to make up ground, started swishing his tail, so... 
I think this horse is a real question mark uh, come Breeders' Cup Saturday. When, it, when I assume he'll be in the Classic. It is over his home track at Santa Anita, but this can't be an effort and inspires much confidence. Uh, sure, the strategy wasn't great. Uh, in my opinion, he lost too much ground. The pace was slow. He tried to run into the, the teeth of the race when it really picked up. But just overall, not an inspiring effort. Uh, I haven't heard any interviews on the subject, if that was a strategy, not fully cranked up. But I think a mile and a quarter is still a question with this horse and getting beat here at a mile and an eighth against pretty suspect older horses has to make you wonder as for the winner mongolian groom uh, he, he ran a com career best 126 this day the final time speed figure was actually a 128 it's knocked down a couple points because of the slow pace but uh not sure what they're going to do with this one just because it was a win in your in race he's actually not breeders cup nominated so it would cost a couple hundred thousand for him to get in and it seems like his connections are still a little bit iffy on that and could possibly be sending him over to i believe it was japan to run in one of their big races so again he's one we'll just have to follow the news and, and see what our reporters say out there in california and what's going on with mongolian groom uh that said he's not a horse i'd be very interested in even if he does show up in the classic i think uh this was the time to bet him if you were ever going to bet him uh this was the wedding you don't want to go to the funeral next time out uh, as for the others higher power he ran okay coming off his big pacific classic win he didn't break particularly well that probably cost him a little bit but he still ran his normal race, which is around a 120 time form U.S. speed figure. He got a 118 with the trouble here. But that's just not a figure that's going to win a race like the Classic. Probably not even going to hit the board. So not sure what the plans are with that one, but not really interested in him. Uh, this leads me to one of my questions from a Stefan Stoikovich, I'm going to guess. Uh, he can correct me on Twitter if I said that wrong. But he was saying that he remembered us guys mentioning that we will add ground loss to our figures as an option if that was being considered. Uh, I've said all along that is something, and that would have been interesting with a horse like McKenzie, and maybe I'll go do it manually, see how the numbers come out. But in this case, we, we just have to wait until the data is actually available in a, you know from one of our providers. For now, it's just impossible to do all the tracks, track ground loss. Uh, there are tracks out there that have trackists, but that's not part of our data feed from Equibase. But sooner or later, it's going to happen. Uh, Equibase is moving to a new GPS system as a lot of tracks. It has the capability of providing similar data to what we've seen from trackists in the past. Uh, so when it's available, it is certainly something that we'll be interested in doing. But for now, we just leave that to handicappers. Uh, this is a particularly interesting one. I don't think that pace is some. I think that pace is something that has a huge effect on how important ground loss is. So, for example, the pace of this race was really slow. Uh, Mongolian Groom ran the first quarter and half mile with only 109 time form U.S. pace figures. So if you're wide around that first turn, it's probably not as big a deal with the pace being slow. But when it picked up on that second turn and the horses were really flying, they moved from a 109 after a half mile to a 128 at the finish. So it's clearly where the fastest part of the race was. If you were wide on that second turn trying to make up ground as McKenzie was, I think this is a case where that ground's a lot more important than ground lost on the first turn. And that is certainly something where if we ever get around to doing this, and I'd love to do it, it's not going to be a flat lose a length that costs this many points. It's going to depend when it happens and how the pace was during that time of the race. Uh, let's cut back to Friday for a minute at uh, Santa Anita. And we had a couple, uh, three graded stakes races on Friday, which kind of rare these days in American racing, but it made for a fun Friday. And Santa Anita ran their two-year-olds. They started with uh, the great, well, they didn't start with it, but I'm going to start with the grade one American Pharaoh. And probably the most exciting two-year-old we saw this weekend uh, was Eight Rings. Eight Rings had came back from that Del Mar Futurity where he had trouble at the start, ducked into the chute, uh, dumped the rider. He did go out. I believe he ran around the field and finished ahead of him, but I don't put a whole lot of stock in that. But he was coming off a 111 debut uh, when, when he headed into that Del Mar, Del Mar Futurity. 
And that's why he went off the favorite that day. And he definitely backed up that effort. Uh, most of the talk was that this was Bob Baffert's strongest two-year-old. And I don't think he's any doubt that he showed it. Uh, John Velasquez came in to ride him. Um, I believe Drayden Van Dyke is coming off an injury, so he wasn't able to commit at the time. And John Velasquez rode this horse masterfully, as you'd expect from the Hall of Famer. Uh, he took him right to the lead. Set a quick pace. We had the uh, the half mile and the three quarters coated in red. And he wound up with that 109 off of a 105 time form U.S. Uh, final time number. So we upgraded because of the pace by four points. Uh, it was six lengths back in second to American Theorem, a horse who had won his debut promisingly at only five and a half furlongs. Not a terrible effort, but certainly a big gap to the winner. Uh, eight rings will probably vie for favoritism in the uh, Breeders' Cup Juvenile, along with Dennis's moment, who would be shipping in for Kentucky. He's certainly lacking on speed figures compared to that one. That one's run some quick ones, 120s, uh, 120 in his maiden win. I think he ran a 118 second time back. So he would definitely have some ground to make up on Dennis's moment from that angle, but he will have home home court advantage with the race being run at Saratoga. And certainly a strong effort. Uh, not sure what, what else there is to say about him. He's going to be right up there. He's going to be one of the contenders in the juvenile, and he's going to be a horse to deal with. The Philly version of this race for two-year-olds, a grade one chandelier, was quite a different story. This race, These races were polar opposites as far as the pace goes. Uh, we had Bast, another heavy favorite from Bob ba uh, Bob Baffert coming in, uh, wound up going off at one to five, but that's about where the similarities end. This race was completely different from a pace perspective. Uh, all our pace figures are coded in blue for this race. Uh, the final time figure was only on 99, so six points below the uh, American Pharaoh stakes. But you'll notice on our overall time form U.S. speed figures, it's a full 14 points uh, as Bast only gets a 95. Uh, that 99 was knocked down a little bit because of the slow pace. I'm not sure exactly what to make of this race. I don't want to penalize Bass too much. Comical ran good. A lot of people were pointing to her as a horse who hadn't been particularly fast. She had run four or five times already. I mean, she was no uh, lightly raced horse, but this was her first time around two turns. She set that slow pace and my if I had to lean one way right now, I would tend to think Bast is better than the number would indicate. You often get, when you get a pace this slow, it's kind of hard to really create any separation. Uh, Comico basically went so slow on the front end that it turned this race into almost a two and a half to three furlong race. And as a horse who's proven to be a pretty good Philly sprinter, it was always going to be hard to run from Com run away from Comico late in the race. Uh, so to only win by a neck, I I'm not going to indict Bass too much. I, I think with a better pace set up, she would have probably run a better number. She probably would have won easier. And I do like that she was able to sit a little closer than she had previously and, and still finish the race. So when she runs back, I'm going to be more likely to judge her on that 107 that she won, uh, ran when she was winning the Del Mar debutante so impressively last out, rather than that 95 here. On the other hand, Comical, based on her prior performances, she's won and I'm going to say is that was probably about as good as we're going to see from her. I think the 95 is an accurate representation. And if she wound up in a race like the uh, Juvenile or maybe the Los Al Starlet later in the year, I'm not going to give her any extra credit for this effort. She had things all her own way, couldn't hold off the winner. Uh, she was able to hang close with her. But again, I think that was more a function of pace dynamics than anything else. Uh, before we get to some of the other races, I did have a question about uh, from Wellborn Stud on Twitter who asked if I'd agree that there are so many promising two-year-olds. Uh, I would say every year there's lots of promising two-year-olds. Uh, some go on, some fall, fall by the wayside, but we generally always get plenty of, of fast horses starting out and sprinting. I, I'm going to withhold judgment till we see more and more of these horses go around two turns, get a little more tougher acid test, you know, face a little more pace and see how they do. But generally as horse racing fans, it's always our most exciting horses we want to see. We're always looking for those next stars and there's certainly plenty to pick from this year. 
that that have shown that potential. Whether it'll happen or not, it's tough to say. Uh, that question, by the way, was from Wellburn Stud. Don't know his real name. That's his Twitter handle and also what the title is. So uh, that said, let's move on to some of the older horses at Santa Anita. I'm going to move to some turf racing and start with the grade one Rodeo Drive. Rodeo Drive. And this race was won by Murph, trained by Phil D'Amato, who, who is just a titan of training out there in Santa Anita, particularly when it comes to, uh, to turf racing. And... You know, as much as I talked about Mike Smith and I wasn't that thrilled with his ride on McKenzie, this was a great ride. He, This was a horse I didn't really like. Uh, she hadn't shown the ability to beat a field like this before. Didn't really have the figures to do it. But Mike used the horse the way she is. He took her out on a clear lead, used her speed. And a clear lead is always dangerous. And I think they actually get a little more dangerous as distances get longer in these races. Generally, if a horse opens up a big lead at a mile or a mile and a sixteenth, even a mile and an eighth, uh, that usually means they're going much too fast. But that it doesn't always mean that's the case when you get a mile and a quarter, mile and a half races. And I just thought he rode this race perfectly. Uh, Bo Recall was the six to five favorite in here. She made a nice run to get second, but she just couldn't catch Merch. She had too much of a, a head start on her. Uh, she wound up winning with a 119 time form US speed figure, which is pretty solid. I mean, I assume maybe she'll show up in the Breeders' Cup. Uh, do I think Mirth is a real contender? Probably not. Uh, not with the uh, the armada of Chad Brown fillies and mares that we'll probably have showing up. We'll certainly get some dangerous shippers coming in from Europe who are always tough. So I, I don't think she's a real contender. Don't think Bo Recall is. The, the rest of the field was fairly weak in here. But it wouldn't surprise me if she was the pace setter. I mean, it pretty much showed that's what she wants to do. Uh, I would assume that they, they would take her right to the front if she's ent entered in the Philly Mare turf over, you know, her local course. But again, not really all that thrilled with her, but solid effort for this day. This was the day to have her. Probably don't want her going forward. Uh, we moved back to Friday where they ran the grade two Eddie D stakes, uh, five furlongs on the turf, which is kind of a fairly new distance at Santa Anita. I can't remember if they started this year or last year, but they, they hadn't run this distance in quite a long time if they even had before. But with the demise of at least temporarily the down the hill six and a half furlong races, uh, we've mostly gone the five furlong races. They did run a couple five and a half furlong races this weekend at Santa Anita. I'm not sure if maybe they're considering changing the distance of the Breeders' Cup turf sprint to five and a half, and this is a test for that, or if it's just to get a little more variety. Uh, right now on the Breeders' Cup site, the uh, race is listed as five furlongs for that BC turf sprint. So I'm going to go with that. And this was a pretty strong field in here. Uh, Pee Wee Reese wound up getting the win. He, he did it with a nice 120 speed figure. Uh, he hadn't been seen since the end of March where he run, won a race down the hill with a 125 time form U.S. speed figure. But the layoff didn't, obviously didn't prove a problem. He went off second choice in here at 5-2. to two. And he got a great ride by Flavian Pratt in here. He just sat off the speed. I don't remember the name of the pace setter, but it was a long shot who looked like looked likely to make the lead. We had him first on our pace projector, but Flavian knew that this horse was probably going to tire and he was probably going to drift a little bit as tired horses tend to do. And he just stayed glued to that rail. And when the leader drifted out, he shot right up the rail, took control of the race and was able to just hold off uh, Eddie Haskell, the uh, second or actually the, the favorite in here at nine to five. And he held that ho horse off mostly because of the ground he saved. Uh, I would argue Eddie Haskell was probably the best horse in here. He's been in top form all year. He's been a little unlucky the last couple races. Last time he, he had a bit of a pace. The pace setup wasn't very great. This time Pee Wee Reese got a dream, dream trip while he lost a lot of lengths around the turn. So just a really top effort from, from him off that layoff. Not sure if it's going to be good enough to handle a horse like World of Trouble, who we haven't seen for a little while since Saratoga, but a horse who probably is the leader of this uh, turf sprint division. He's won grade ones on he's won on both turf and dirt. I think both grade one sprinting. He was a narrow loser last year in the Breeders' Cup turf sprint, and is set to def to come back and try to capture that title. 
Uh, he lost last year to Stormy Liberal, who actually ran third in this race. Uh, I'm a big Stormy Liberal fan, but it seems like he might have finally lost a step. He had every right to uh, to run a big race here. He was only beaten about a length and three quarters, maybe two lengths. But he just doesn't seem like quite the same horse. He, he came back from Dubai. He's run okay. He's not, not terrible, but he just doesn't seem to have that sharp form he had the past couple years. So... Stormy Liberal is one I'm going to be against. Uh, I'd have to keep an eye out on Pee Wee Reese and going to hold off talking too much about this turf sprint until we know what's going on and who's coming. We got, got some horses coming from overseas, though generally that that's not a uh, a great angle. Shippers from overseas haven't had a lot of luck in the sprint, and I doubt that five furlongs around the turn would be up their alley. But we'll wait and see who comes before uh, getting too deep into that. Another race we had at Santa Anita was the Grade 2 John Henry Turf Championship. And again, the California Turf Division, definitely not the strongest. We talk about that on this pace cast many times over. But you do get a solid group of deep, uh, deep, uh, deep fields that are pretty evenly matched. And this time the winner came out to be Cleopatra's Strike. Uh, once again, trained by Phil D'Amato, who I already mentioned earlier. This horse was coming... Second off a pretty long layoff, had been off since January before returning to run a nice second in an allowance race. And this horse just got a, a decent pace set up. He was able to run down Acclimate, who had won very nicely going wire to wire, but was turning back in distance. And it, it's funny to say for a speed horse, but I think this race might just be a little too short for Acclimate. He probably prefers to set that pace going longer. Uh, he held on gamely for second. I, I imagine both of these two will point to the Breeders' Cup turf. Uh, it will be a new distance for Cleopatra Strike. He hasn't really gone this far that I remember, certainly not at this level of competition. But the way he finished the race, it, it doesn't seem like it would be a big problem, but you never really know. Uh, he got a 121 time form U.S. speed figure, which, to be frank, is not going to be competitive in a race like the the Breeders' Cup turf. And you could say the same for Acclimate. He also got a 121, uh, slightly boosted because of that fast pace. But he, he ran a 120 last time in, in victory, and I just don't think that's going to make either one of these two a serious contender. So I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this race. I do think Acclimate will be the pace setter in the Breeders' Cup. I mean, there's no other strategy to run. If they're, if they're going to run him in that race, there's no other way to go for him. He'll certainly lead for a long way, but I just don't think he's a, a serious contender. And like I said, the same goes for Cleopatra Strike. The surprise to me of the weekend was the grade two Zenyatta stakes where Paradise Woods, who, who's been really erratic lately, she'll run some big wins, run some poor wins, turned out and ran another one of her big ones. Uh, the pace was solid this day. Uh, I don't have the official pace for speed or pace figures yet, but she's going to get about a 121 time form US speed figure. The final time is going to be around 119 or or 120. So the pace was solid. It's not going to be coated in red or anything like that. But she just was able to sit just off a of secret spice. So horse who we talked about on our forecast probably doesn't want to go quite this far. A mile on the 16th, it, it seems to be she just never is able to hold on at the end of these races. And it proved true once again. Paradise Woods was able to to pass her and go on to a pretty easy win, winning by almost two lengths. Uh just not sure what to make of this one. She in the Breeders' Cup this half, assuming she goes there, we're going to get to see her uh, on her home track. She'll probably be up close to the lead, and I guess it just depends which Paradise Wood shows up. She had some trouble in the gate the last couple times, which didn't seem like a great sign to me. But she showed no such uh, thing this time. She broke clean, was right up near the front, and ran good. Uh, now whether she can handle horses like. Midnight Bisu, some of the three-year-olds like Arana, um, the horse who won the Cotillion, whose name's escaping me right now, but a really good three-year-old filly. That's yet to be seen, uh, but she'll be an interesting horse. I'll probably be against her again. I, I'm not a fan of horses that go, you know, are so erratic in their form like this, but it wouldn't shock me if she, she was to run well in the distaff because she's always been a very talented filly and... Now, mayor now, I guess. I think she's a five-year-old, but uh, I'm glad she's still around racing. I remember people crying for her retirement for a while, saying she was, you know, eh, 
looked like she was off form, but I always suspected the sprint thing wasn't the way to go with her. I, I like seeing her around two turns, and it's definitely the way to go. Uh, keep her around those two turns. I think it's where she runs her big races. As to the others, uh, Secret Spice got a 120 in here. As mentioned, I I just don't think it's her distance. I'm not sure what they're going to want to do with her. I would imagine they would want to turn her back to the Philly and Mare Sprint, although she hasn't had a whole lot of success sprinting. It's a race that always seems to get a fast pace, so at the very least, she could come running late. And even the Dirt Mile might be an option for her. She's been fine running a mile. We often don't get fillies trying that race, or females, I should say, but maybe we'll get that here. Um, just doesn't seem to be a race that really fits her. She's a filly who probably likes a mile and... You know, it's just one of those things. You can't have a race for for every little niche distance, and, and she doesn't have one. So I'd probably expect to see her in the Philly Mare Sprint, and if a fast pace is expected, she might get a nice setup and run well. Uh, the real puzzle for me in here, uh, question mark in here, was Ollie's Candy. I, I'm not sure what happened with her, why she was so far back. She had beat some of these when going right to the lead. She had won her both both of her dirt races, and somehow found herself seven lengths back after the opening quarter mile. Uh, I didn't really see anything at the break that caused trouble. I don't know if it was a strategy or if she just wasn't in the bit, but she actually ran pretty well to make up several of those lengths. She almost caught Secret Spice late for second, but not not sure what to make of her. Probably not a Breeders' Cup filly at this point, but if she is, it, you got to scratch that strategy. I, I don't think she's a horse that's going to come from way back. She's run well on turf before. That's not really how she runs, and it's certainly not not better on dirt. So a little puzzling on her. Uh, I'd have to watch the replay again and see what I think about that one. Uh, we got a couple more venues to go as uh, we're getting close to the end. That was the big races at Belmont and Santa Anita. On Saturday night, they run a card under the lights at Churchill Downs, and they had a couple of graded stakes on there that we're going to talk about. Not too in-depth, because I don't think these were the, the strongest races. Uh, the first was the Grade 3 Lucas Classic. Uh, it was at a mile and an eighth, two turns there at Churchill uh, I didn't draw the strongest of fields. It, it's a grade three on paper, and, and that's how it looked on the track as well. Uh, Mosito Rojo actually wound up winning the race. He ran a 117 time form U.S. speed figure. Uh, he's a neat story. He's a good claim. I think he was claimed for about 10000 a while back. He's won a ton of, ton of money. He actually won the opening day Governor's Cup here in Oklahoma at my home track of Remington Park. But this is a weak grade three. When you're talking 117 speed figures, uh, maybe a little bit was due to the slow pace. But it just wasn't a particularly fast race. Not one I'm going to be too excited about. And not none of these horses are going in my stable mail. Uh, the one big disappointment from this race, race was Quip. I think he went off the favorite in here. Uh, he was coming out of just a dreadful effort in a Pacific Classic where he was bet, set a slow pace, and just packed it in and, and didn't do any running. Uh, they didn't really find any excuses that day. They were hoping he just didn't like the track, but it appears to me something's just not right with Quip because he was never really a factor in this race. Finished well back and... and just not a good performance, so I, I don't think we'll be seeing much of Quip anytime soon until they figure out what, what the issue is with him. The better race on the card was the Grade 3 ak, -Ak. Uh, It was just around one turn. I think it was a mile race. Uh, for some reason, I'm thinking they used to run this at 7 or 7.5, but pretty sure it was a mile here. And Mr. Freeze ran a really nice race second off the layoff. He got a 122 time form U.S. speed figure for the effort. Uh, this was a promising three-year-old. Uh, he romped in the West Virginia Derby last year, uh, so much so that they tried him in the PA Derby against McKenzie. But he just didn't run well at all. Something clearly went amiss that day, and he wasn't seen again until January. He came back and tried a turf stakes, where once again he didn't run a bit. And we didn't see him again until August, where he came back, and he actually ran a nice second in an allowance race. Got a 113 time form U.S. speed figure that day and jumped right back to his best performances with that 122. Um, promising horse, obviously talented. Uh, he, he beat some 
fairly nice horses in here. The horse who beat him in that uh, allowance race return, Mr. Darcy, finished third in here. So he's clearly a horse on the improve, and I wouldn't be shocked if this one showed up in the dirt mile. It's always kind of tough to gauge who's going to show up in that dirt mile. It's kind of an in-between race. Uh, sometimes sprinters try it. Sometimes horses turn him back in distance who really aren't classic-type horses. Look to this race. Uh, I've even heard Matoli being mentioned as he could try this race. Though that one seems a little puzzling to me as he's never been around two turns. But I could see Mr. Freeze being a contender in there, especially third off the layoff. Plenty of talent. He's got speed. Doesn't need the lead. So this is one I, I look forward to seeing run. Uh, solid effort and definitely the best horse we saw on the Twilight card at Churchill on Saturday night. Okay, we're going to close out the podcast with uh, my home track of Remington Park. It was the, the biggest day every year here. They run the Oklahoma Derby, the Remington Park Oaks, and an assortment of other stakes. Uh, I should mention, though, he didn't win the Derby. Steve Asmussen just had quite a day. He, Him and his uh, main rider, uh, Santana, I'm forgetting his first name, Ricardo Santana Jr., uh, won seven run a day, and some of them were favorites, some of them not. It, there were actually a few prices mixed in there, and it was just quite a show by those two. So I'll start with one that they did win, and that's the grade three Remington Park Oaks. Uh, it was won by Lady Apple. It was only a four-horse field. It wasn't knocked down by scratches. That's all they were able to get. And in part, it was probably because of her. Uh, she's a little stronger than the usual horses we get in for this race. Uh, she had won a couple of grade threes already. She won the fantasy stakes at Oak One, uh, went on to the Kentucky Oaks where things didn't work out very well. But she came back in good form, has since won the Iowa Oaks. Uh, tried one of the races at Saratoga. I think it was a coaching club of America. Oaks didn't run very well, but boy, did she re rebound here. Uh, her and Gold Standard put, put on quite a show. It was an interesting race, despite there being only four horses. All four horses had some speed. And going down the back stretch, they were just four across the track, all nose and nose. And it looked like it was going to be quite the thriller, and it was, but two of the horses dropped out the two longer prices, and we were left with Gold Standard, who actually went off the three to five favorite in here over Lady Apple, who was six to five. And these two just put on a show. They ran away from the field. I think it was eight lengths back to third. And it looked like Lady Apple was really going to just put away Gold Standard and draw away. She actually opened up by a length and a half. But Gold Standard really dug in through the stretch, and I actually thought she might come back on and get the win. Uh, the pace was quick in here, despite the four horses being across the track. Uh, not quick enough to get the, the red fractions, but we had a 130 after six furlongs. The final time for the winner was a 116. So Lady Apple wound up with a 120 time form U.S. speed figure, as did Gold Standard, the runner-up. So... Although this race was only a grade three in stature, it was more than that from a speed figure perspective. I think both of the top two could move up in class and be contenders. Certainly not horses you want to look at in the disc staff, but horses that, that could make a make some noise in some bigger races. Uh, and I don't want to slight gold standard at all, at all. Like I said, she was coming on late. This was her first loss on dirt in four tries, and it's the first time she really got challenged. Her other three wins had be easy. Uh, had been really easy wins by open lengths, and I thought she really showed a lot of heart in here. So either one of these two are, are good fillies, and I expect more than grade threes from them in the future. Uh, that's going to lead us to the other grade three on the card, the grade three Oklahoma Derby. But in my opinion, th this is the strongest field we've ever had for this race. Certainly since I've been living here, I got back here in 2008. I've seen a whole bunch of these Oklahoma Derbies. And even with the scratch attacks, who was going to be one of the favorites who had, had won the Jim Dandy uh, earlier, run second in the wood. I believe he won the Withers. Even with that scratch, we had some really nice horses in here with Owendale and Mucho Gusto and just a strong field. And it turned out to be a good race. Uh, Owendale, who's a horse my, 
my not my assistant, my co-host had talked about he really liked in this race because he had run on that dead rail at Saratoga and the Travers, and he backed it up. Uh, this wasn't an overly quick pace. It, it was just solid. It kind of slowed in the middle. It was set by Sleepy Eyes Todd, who's one we'll talk about here in a minute. And he was able to uh, hold off Mucho Gusto, the four to five favorite trained by Bob Bafford, who was coming out of a third in the Travers. He had run second behind Max maximum security in the Haskell, but he just wasn't able to get it done this day. He drew the 10 post. He kind of tracked off a of sleepy eyes, Todd. And when he challenged that one, he just, he got by him briefly, but he, he couldn't stay by him. But charging up on the outside was Owen Dale. He, he got not really a quick pace, but he got a contested pace. Uh, there was a lot of traffic up front and he just kind of swooped around him in one easy uh, he got that one uh, 124 time form U.S. speed figure for the effort. He matched what he had won uh, two races back when he won. I can't remember if it was the Ohio Derby or the, the Indiana Derby. I apologize for that. I, I keep getting those races mixed up. But it was a race where he beat Math Wizard, who has since come back to win the Pennsylvania Derby. So probably a stronger race than the grade three that one had. And I think this one was as well. That 124 is right up there with the better three-year-old figures we've been seeing. Uh, Code of Honor has been a little bit quicker as have, as Maximum Security, but that's about it. So a strong race from him. I, I'm not sure what they're going to do with him. I saw they're thinking either Classic or Dirt Mile. Uh, with his running style, I would think Classic is probably more suited to him, for him. Not sure he's quite to that level, but... Given how wide open that division is this year, uh, we're, I've even heard talk elites are now seriously being considered for that race. Uh, rather than having to face Midnight Bisu again, uh, trying longer distance against, again, a suspect group. If, if McKinsey's a leader after seeing his race, that's probably the way I'd lean. I'd be more likely to, to try that race in a dirt mile, which is probably at a shorter distance that he likes on a track where it's it's not going to be easy to make up ground. So good effort by Owen Dale. Good race for Remington Park. They good field, solid day of stakes racing and had a great time out there as I always do. Uh, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Timeform U.S. Pacecast. Uh, we will have the Timeform U.S. forecast on Friday. Hopefully my, my uh, co-host David Aragona will be back that day. Uh, I always like hearing his insights. I didn't get to talk about any breeding or anything like that today, which he knows far more about than I do. Uh, so I always like hearing his insights on those. And maybe we'll talk briefly if he had any special insights he wanted to add to these races. So... That's going to do it for this week. Uh, as always, you can find this uh, podcast on DRF.com, Spotify, Apple pa Podcasts, YouTube, and SoundCloud. Uh, we'll be back Friday with the Timeform US uh, forecast. Until then, good luck. <laughs>